Um, so the data model that like, we use a back type is different than the relational data model. Um, and it's, it's just kind of subtly different. <clears throat> so let me just uh, show some examples. So what we store is in our master data set is we store just a bunch of records. It's just a list of records. And every record contains one discrete fact. So an example of a fact might be that Alice, and we have some identifier for Alice, uh, Alice lives in San Francisco as of time one, two, three, four, five. Right? So you have some fact about some entity, and then that's associated with some moment of time, the moment in time you knew that fact to be true. Right? Another fact may be Bob and Gary are friends as of time one, three, seven, two, three. Right, so this fact is kind of an example of a relationship between entities. Bob is one entity, Gary is one entity, and they have this friendship relationship. Uh, and then another fact we may have is that Alice lives in New York as of time 19827. Um, so as you can see here, right, we kind of have two facts for where does Alice live. She lived in San Francisco at some time. She lived in New York at some time. Now in a traditional relational model, you'd have some key representing Alice, and she'd have some location column. And when you, when you wanted to update her location, you would override that column, and you'd kind of lose that fact that she used to live in San Francisco. Right? So in our data model, it's append only, so we just append that this new fact was true at some moment in time. So that whole, so that whole notion of where does she live now is a view on this data. Right? The current location view is what is Alice's most recent known location. Right? So this is different than the, than the relational model. Like we don't have updates or deletes, and honestly, we don't think updates or deletes even make sense. Right? Like the fact that Alice lives in New York now doesn't change the fact that she lived in San Francisco before. Right? So it's really useful for us to actually just have all this data in our master data store so we can use it if we want to use it. And it turns out data like this is extremely interesting. Right? We have this historical snapshot of every entity in our system. And this is really useful for analytics. Um, it's really useful for debugging. And it's really useful for when things go wrong and you write bad data, right? In a relational database, if you write the wrong location, well, you, now you, you lost the old location. Right? You may have backups, but the backups may not be completely um, updated. Whereas here, if you write bad data, you just remove the bad records and you still have, um, you still have the data that was correct. Um, and basically, this data model, um, when you work it out, you end up with what we call a graph schema. Like all of our data is represented as just this giant graph. Um, so here on this diagram, um, the circles are nodes in our graph. And this is, this is, this is back types data model right here. So a node um, might be like a person, like Alice. Um, or a node might be like a tweet, right? Like a tweet identified, you know, maybe Twitter's tweet ID is one, two, three. And then Nodes can have properties, so Alice you know, may have the property that her gender is female, she may have you know, the property of age or any other properties. And then you have edges between nodes, and these are just relationships between entities. So reactor edges is, means that this person is responsible for this tweet. Um, then we can have reaction edges. You know, this just means that tweet 123 was a reaction to tweet 456. You know, in this case, <clears throat> Tweet 123 was a retweet of tweet 456. Right? And then through this properties and edges model, you kind of represent everything. It's like a universal data model. So like back type, like we collect all the data from Twitter, data from Facebook, you know, we have YouTube data and blog data, and it all just fits within one schema, and it's really easy to extend um, and use because it is this universal data model. Um, cool. So that's all I have for you guys. Uh, I guess I'll just open it up to questions. Go back to your, go back to your model. This one? This one? Yeah. Sure. Like, how does it work in code? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I can just actually just show you, actually. I have an example. Okay. So we use this tool called Thrift to do this. Thrift is this cross-language uh, serialization framework. Um, so basically, 
Um, like here's just an excerpt from uh, our schema. So Thrift has this language neutral schema definition language. Um, so basically, um, so it's not this no, 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 Thrift is language neutral. So basically the idea behind Thrift is that you specify your schema <clears throat> using this uh, language and then you use Thrift to generate code so that you can read and write objects of this language, or read and write objects of these types in any language. Um, Thrift's not the only thing out there that does this. Like, there's protocol buffers, is it was open sourced by Google, and there's another project called Avro, which does a similar thing. Uh, but basically, um, if you look at our data, we have, at the core of our data set, or basically every piece of data we have fits within this data structure. Um, right? And the key field in the data structure is this thing called a data unit. And if you look at a data unit, it's this union type. So a data unit could be one of any of those types. Uh, I don't know if people can see. So that's how you build the Yeah, exactly. So we have like a reaction property. Uh, and a reaction property contains some reaction node ID. And a reaction node ID, there's a bunch of different kinds of reactions. So there's tweets, there's like blog posts, there's comments. Um, and then it contains this reaction property value, and that can be like the content of the reaction or some snippet about it, a property about whether it was a retweet or not. Um, and you do this, we do the same thing for people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the schema. Yeah, and then this other structure called pedigree. That's where we put that really important um, value, which is uh, when. When did we know this piece of data to be true? Are you using a set of generalized operators that, that say you would have in, in, in you know, executing relational calculus and relational yeah. Or are you defining custom operators yeah. that know how to manipulate so, certain Yeah, so uh, that question has an incredibly long answer to it. Uh, <laughs> well, I think, I think you're, you're, yeah. you are manipulating, you're putting your own manipulation. Yeah. So I'll just show you some code. Uh, it's going to be completely foreign, so I'm not going to try to explain it because that takes a long time. But this uses this library we wrote called Cascalog. Uh, and Cascalog lets you use something called data log to manipulate data. Um, yeah. It, data log is a subset of Prolog. Um, basically, this script I have here, it's like 64 lines, or actually it only goes till here. It's like 58 lines of code. And this actually computes for every single person on Twitter, who are the top five people that influence them? And exports that into a database. And it's like not that much code, as you can see. Like batch computation, like there's a lot to learn about it, but like it ends up not being that hard because you use simple algorithms and if you use the right tools, then um, you know, you get just as much power as you would with something like SQL, but in, in this case you actually get even a lot more power and ex ex expressiveness. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. It just it like you know. So like any like data processing like pattern or something, you can capture in a function basically, and then you can just use that function. That's basically the model we use. Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead. So our raw records literally exist within a single folder on a distributed file system. So there's just going to be a whole bunch of files in there um, that just contain the records. It's not indexed, it's just unordered. It's just there, uh, just in place so we can do batch computation on it. Right. Yeah. 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 Like we actually store all of our data. We use. Uh, if you're, if you're familiar with AWS, AWS or Amazon Web Services, they provide uh, something called um, a service called S3, which is essentially a distributed file system, and, and we just store all of our data in there. You could also use, you could use if you're running your own data center, you'd probably want to use something like HDFS, which is Hadoop's distributed file system. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Uh, 
Um, yeah, there's like an open source project called Hive that I'm not a big fan of, which basically implements data warehousing on top of Hadoop. Um, you know, and it just lets you kind of use it using SQL. Obviously, you don't get like real time results because it's running batch jobs, but it does let you use SQL. I'm personally not a big fan of Hive. I think it just adds complexity you don't need. But for people who are like business analysts who only know SQL, it's actually useful for people like that. Yeah. Any questions? Everyone? Uh... I think that's it. All right. A round of applause. Thank you.